Good morning, River Oak Grace peeps. How are you today? Amen. Today I will preach with as much enthusiasm as you have. <clears throat> and I hear you today. I know what it looks like to come in and just find a seat and get into, well, a rhythm, a pattern. But I'm telling you here, folks, we're here to meet with the King. Like the, the Lord of Lords, the creator of all, he is desiring to meet with us in this place today. And so I'm going to tune your hearts the best I know how to hear from him today. You see, we started a series a couple of weeks ago looking at what it means for us to make room for God in our life. Now, looking at the schedules and the, uh, the demands on our time and our, our relationships, our rhythms, all these things that, that vie for our attention. Well, what does it look like for us to be making room for God? And we began to unpack on the very front end of this of what it looks like to make room to hear from God. What it looks like to understand his call, his vision, his purpose for our lives. Where he's leading us to use our talents to, to serve and to be part of the kingdom, building the kingdom. Last week we began to unpack the idea of what it means to, well, make room to share. And I began to unpack for you what it looked like to be intentional as a church to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to a hurting world. And I began to unpack for you those three circles that I pray will become very much a part of the DNA of your routine, your rhythms, my rhythms, as a world around us desperately needs to encounter the grace, mercy, and salvation of Jesus Christ. And this morning, I, I wear one of the bracelets that walks us through those three circles. And if you want one, we've got them at our Next Steps booth. And some of you are like, Corey, that looks like something a junior hire would wear. Or even looks like a hospital bracelet. Well, here's the thing. I don't wear it to make a fashion statement. In no way am I saying, oh, this is just cool. I look at this just hoping somebody will ask me, what's that on your wrist? Oh, ho, ho, ho. let me tell you what's on my wrist. <laughs> uh, because I would love to talk to you about, well, what life looks like when it's broken. Have you ever been in a place that you just find yourself hurting or lonely or anxious? And, and what we do in our life to try and address those feelings and anxieties that we wrestle with. And, and I just recognize when we come to a place of knowing who really is there to address that brokenness. Because all the other things I've tried have failed. And, and I get a chance to tell someone that Jesus Christ died for them. And that to know him personally, to recognize that by our faith, we can understand his grace and his mercy lavished over our life when they realize that he died and was buried and rose again for them to bring them new life. And well, then I get to introduce that third circle of God's design for their life. How they can walk in the life and the joy that he desires to give. And I set that goal and I was clear last week with some of the, the, the math I tried to communicate to us that gives us a, a glimpse of why it's necessary. That in a city of our size, recognizing that it takes someone anywhere from 8 to 12 times to hear a gospel message before, well, before receiving it, before acting on it. As I broke that down for you, I, I helped you recognize that to cha change our city with the gospel of Jesus Christ, it will take 200,000 gospel presentations to see this, cha this city changed with the message of Jesus Christ. And so what did I say? I'm going to set a goal for our church this year of a thousand gospel presentations. Not church invites, not invites to an event, but, but actually telling someone how they can meet Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and bring them to a point of actually having a choice. Do I want him or do I not? And we put that glass case out in our front porch where every time you present that gospel message, we're asking you to write that first name on a ping pong ball and drop it in there for us to see throughout this year how our church is taking steps to share our faith. Why? Well, because the local church is the hope of the world. You say, well, Pastor, none of the gospel is the hope of the world. Well, who did God call to share the gospel? The local church. That's our commissioning by God's word to take the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, into the world and bring hope. So as we look at that and we embrace that, today I want you to be able to think of this wall because today we're still asking you, who is the one person in your life that God's given you influence with that you could write that name, not a prayer request, a name on a piece of paper and place it on that wall so that every time you walk into this place of worship, you'll be reminded 
that person who God's put into your influence to share Jesus Christ with. That was last week, not today. That was last week. Because see, today, I get the privilege, the opportunity to talk to you about something that, that, man, I believe brings the church alive. And, And it's a message I know you are dying to hear, that you came today just so excited to catch a glimpse of how we make room to give. See, that's what I'm talking about. You know, I, I realize that some of you today are like, wait, wait a minute, Pastor. I mean, this is the first time I've been to church this year, and you're going to talk about money. Well, if you came more often, you'd hear a different message. You know? And so I, I know that for some of you today, that, that, that doesn't set well. It's like, well, I, I don't want to hear a message on money. But I want you to hear clearly today the why it's important for us as a church to understand why and how we make room to give. Why it's important to us. Because, see, there is a natural tendency in all of us to mirror some stories that I think came out of the pandemic in some really vivid ways. During the pandemic, we recognize not just in our nation, but globally, it hit places uh, in different ways. But something caught my attention when I read an article about a business owner in Poland that when everything began to shut down in Poland, there was a different conversation about churches. And so in Poland, a business owner of a local gym, there outside of Warclaw, he, he began to recognize the restrictions being placed on his business. So he decided to change the name of his gym from the Atlantic Gym or the Atlantic uh, Fitness Gym to the Church of the Healthy Body. And so what he did is he now began to to promote and market that those that were members of the gym were now the congregants of the church of the healthy body. And all the trainers were now the, the elders of the church that would speak into people's lives when they would come in to the church of the healthy body. Now, you can imagine that there was some significant pushback to this particular action on a businessman's, well, a businessman's watch, his choice. And, but what he said captured my attention because I think it speaks to all of us. When asked why he did it, he said, well, I hate loopholes. But it comes down to money, and we're just trying to survive here. And I believe with each and every one of us, there have been points in our journey, if not today, where financially we're just trying to survive. And so what does that lead us to do? It leads us to look at God's word or believe some things that may not even be in God's word to provide us a loophole to feel better about not giving. That we look at the the commands of scripture, we look at the leading of the spirit in our life and we begin to think to ourselves, it's really not that big of a deal. I mean, come on, there's so many other people that that can do this because pastor, I'm not at a point, I can can do that. I, I, I just can't, I'm just trying to survive here, preacher. But here's the problem. Jesus in his word didn't leave any room for loopholes. Like like in scripture, there's so much clarity brought to this topic. You cannot look at it and just begin to pick and choose what you think may or may not speak to you. See, in scripture, we see over 500 verses on faith. And you think about that, well, yeah, Pastor, I mean, of course, there should be some, some verses. I mean, 500 on faith, that sounds good. We see over 500 verses on prayer. And you would sit back and think, well, of course. But we see over 2,000 verses on the issue of money or tr- possessions. Oh, you see, you didn't hear me this morning. There's over 2,000 verses on the issue of money and possessions. It's a central theme in our relationship with our God. And if we avoid that or we simply sit back and say, well, I mean, Pastor, there are so many things in Scripture you could choose from. You don't have to talk about that. Well, here's the problem. Jesus did. And I think in my mind that, hey, we're working today in a world that's desperately saying, would someone just be willing to give me truth? It doesn't even have to be truth I particularly like, but I can stand on and actually believe it to be real, and I can give my life to that. 16 out of 18 parables 
I speak about possessions or treasures in some way. In the Gospels, one out of every ten verses speaks about money. Now, why is that real for us today, though? Uh, when you look at the Western church and you begin to see some of the, the demographics or statistics that come out of different areas of research, in the American church today, this was interesting to me, less than 25% of those that profess a healthy, ongoing relationship with Christ and are part of a local church, less than 25% give a dime to the church. And of that 25%, do you know what the average amount or percentage is that they give to their local church? Two and a half percent of their income. I realize there's not going to be a lot of amens to that because someone's not going to be like, well, that, that, don't look at me. I mean, I, and, and all of us begin to look back at that and say, well, well, I mean, somebody else is doing it though, right? Pastor, I mean, somebody else because, Pastor, I mean, I'm just trying to survive here. Now, before you lose me this morning or you turn this off, I want to be really clear. This church is not the average church. Amen. Church, you have been faithful in so many different ways, and God has blessed this church in ways that I sit back and continually say, amen, God, thank you, hallelujah. Our people are stepping up to the plate. They're, they're becoming obedient and faithful in this area, and I don't like to say that. You know why? Because when you hear that, some of you say, oh, well, I don't need to give anymore. And all of a sudden, there's this weird shift in the life of the church because people find out it's healthy. And why is it healthy? Because we talk about it. And I'm going to preach about it. Why? Because Scripture talks about it. And today, if you're like, man, I, I don't know about this, here's, here's what I'll tell you. If in any way today you sense that there's some kind of prosperity gospel coming out of this, I'd love to talk with you more about that because it can't be further from the truth. I do not believe in any way that God's going to bless you simply because you give. You don't give to get. You give because he's called us to. And so today, if you sense, oh, he's going to tell me if I just plant a seed of $10, God's going to give me a 1000 <sighs> There is nowhere in Scripture that validates that. Matter of fact, you might financially find no favor whatsoever, but you'll understand and experience the joy and life found in the Spirit with your obedience. And I can't help you understand that until you're able to live that. It's a major theme. So making room to hear from God, making room to share the gospel, making room to give. Today I want to draw your attention to a passage found in Matthew chapter 6. Now if that sounds familiar to you, because last year we spent 15 weeks walking through Matthew 5, 6, and 7 with the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to take our attention back to this sermon because, again, it's a portion of Scripture where we see Jesus raising the bar. Like he's elevating an expectation of the life of a believer. Why? So that our dependence would be in him, not in ourselves. And so what we see in the Sermon on the Mount, as Jesus brings up the issue of money, as he raises the bar, he's helping people, that audience then, just like the audience now, understand when you get this, when you walk in this, you begin to experience his kingdom and connect to the life that flows out of that kingdom in ways you will never understand otherwise. And here in Matthew chapter 6, we begin to see Jesus use some really clear words to an audience or a culture at that time that would have had no, what would have found no loophole. And so if you have your Bible this morning, turn with me, your electronic device, or you can follow on our screens. But I'd say today, if you don't have a copy of God's Word, the Bible, we'd love to give you a free gift of that. Following service at our Next Steps booth, make your way back there. They'd love to give you a copy of God's Word today if you don't have one. But there's something, I think, important. We can't go through this whole chapter uh, and, and examine, but I want you to realize in this chapter of Matthew 6, we see the term Father used 11 times. And what Jesus has done in this chapter is he's built a foundation for his audience to understand relationally how they connect with the king of that kingdom. And he makes it so 
well, familiar, so relational that it's not about this, this deity, this ambiguous being in the universe. He's talking about relationship between a father and their child. And as a believer, as someone who walks in faith with Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're not just a believer, you're not just a saint, you're a child of the King. You have a relationship with the Father that looks different than those that have never come to relationship. Why? Because sin, as we see in Scripture, that goes all the way back to Genesis in chapters 1 through 3, we begin to see brokenness set into what the Creator, God, created. And when sin entered the picture, it brought separation between the Creator and His creation. Adam and Eve had a different relationship with the Father when sin entered the picture. And that separation continued throughout history. And it's why it was so important that Jesus Christ came to die for your sin and mine. To pay a final price for, well, the penalty of that sin. To deal with that separation between us and the Father. So when Jesus talks about the Father, this this number of times, he's helping his audience understand it's more than a law, it's, it's more than a regulation, it's more than another rule that the religious leaders would have pro well, proposed. It's, it's relationship. Children of God. And so when I look at this here in Matthew chapter 6, if you would, I want you to start with me in verse 19. 19. Because see, Jesus understood something then, I believe the same way he still understands now. Our relationship to money is one of the healthiest gauges of our spiritual maturity. Let me say that again for those of you that couldn't say amen. Okay? Our relationship with money is one of the strongest gauges of our spiritual maturity. Okay? Of our spiritual health. It's a really important piece of this. Look at this in Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, or where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, I want you to see this morning that the number of times in which Jesus talks about money, often he refers to them as treasures. And it's really important to recognize why he does that because I don't think it's that different for us today. Matter of fact, I think we have a clearer picture of it. See, the idea of treasure for us, I think that word, well, it, it makes that hamster start running in our head, right? Like, treasure. Like, oh, oh, oh. See, if you were to go into your backyard and you were to start digging, like maybe you were putting a pool and all of a sudden that backhoe hits something hard in the ground and you pull it out and you open it up and there's this piece of paper with a map that has an X on it. You're doing renovation in your home and, and you break down one of the walls and inside the drywall, drywall there's, this, there's this safety deposit box that, that you pry open and you find a, a map inside it that has an X on it. Ooh, I mean, there, there's something in here that like, I don't know about this. I mean, there, it, it may be in Portugal. I know where you're going this summer on vacation, okay? I just know that some of you are like, I've got to find out. Like, I, I just, I've got to know. It, it's, like a, it's like Goonies. All of a sudden, you and your friends are on a treasure hunt because you found a piece of paper. So when Jesus talks about treasure, he knows it captures our heart. He knows what captures our mind, our thinking. And I want you to see here how he breaks this out, the word treasure, and what it means to possessions. He says again, look at what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, store up for yourselves some treasures on earth. That's not what he says. He says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because it'll be destroyed. It can be gone in an instant. It can, something can happen in a, in a moment's notice. And our treasures and our possessions, folks, hear me, for all of us, that may look or sound different. For some of you here today, your treasure is in your collection of shoes. Maybe for some of the men in here, it's your suits that you've purchased so that you can look like somebody you're really not. For some of you, maybe it's your cars. For some of you, maybe it's your sports, your hobbies. 
All of us in this room have things we treasure. And, and look at what he says. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth because the stuff will be destroyed. Look at what he says in verse 19. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Jesus is not saying you don't own a phone. Jesus is not saying you can't live in a nice house. Jesus isn't saying you can't drive a nice car. Jesus is not speaking to us in a way that leads us to live in ad abject poverty. He's not calling you to live in some kind of means that's below some standard. What he says is don't store up. Meaning what? Don't begin to amass things you will never need. Don't begin to look at your possessions as if you have to store up in your barns more than you could possibly ever need. And some of us, we hear this and we get uncomfortable because we have some nice things. And I say to you, amen. That's why I'm talking about giving. And it says in verse 20, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus never says anything. He never says anything to us that says it's bad to have money. But what does he do? He warns us. It's not a bad thing if you own a boat. Not a bad thing if you have a beach house, especially if you let the pastor use it. Hey, best amen of the morning right there. I mean, if you heard that amen, I just, I affirm that, hallelujah. You know, but it, it's, it's not a bad thing in Scripture for us to look at the fact there, there are blessings in our life, but it's a matter of, one, how we steward them and know who gave them to us to steward. Amen. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. This is important for us to get here. It's why he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He's saying your stewardship reveals what's true in your heart. If you want to understand something today, if this is all you get from this, is this all you hear from me, hear this, okay? Remember this. God's not trying to steal your joy. God's not trying to have you sacrifice something that takes away from you knowing abundant life. No, what God's saying, what Jesus is saying in this moment is when you begin to understand this principle, you will find out what joy really looks like. He's saying the more that this becomes a part of your maturity as a child of the Father, the more life is rooted in you as your faith grows. Pastor, I'm just trying to survive. And let me tell you, miss this principle and you will continue to live that way for the next 10 years. Amen. You'll continue to live that way the rest of your life. That's why he says in John 15, if you keep my commands, you, what, will remain in my love. Folks, Jesus doesn't leave loopholes here. He's not trying to make us feel comfortable. He's trying to get us to step out into places of deeper faith. He's trying to get us into places where our dependence is not on my ability, but his faith and place in my life. And that I can rest in that knowing he's good and he's faithful. And he goes on to say in verse 11, I've told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Jesus is saying, I didn't come to steal your joy. I came for you to experience it. And that will never happen until we begin to trust enough to step in places of obedience in our life. He's given guide rails, or guidelines, guardrails for us to walk this way. See, I deal with people all the time. They come into my office, or we'll set appointments, and we'll talk, and, and I'll listen to people begin to unpack the, the struggles, the obstacles in their life, and I'll hear about the anxiety, I'll hear about the fear, I'll hear about the conflict, I'll hear about all the struggles that they feel at a very deep level daily. 
And how so often it comes back to a lack of money. And, and for many of us here today, if we were honest with ourselves, in some ways we've placed ourselves in position where there's so much debt that has consumed us, we're wondering if there really is any joy left in the Christian life. Remember, that wasn't the king's fault. Like, like the king didn't say, you need a new boat. Like, like he, he, he didn't do, you, need a, you need a new car. You need that new Corvette. You, you need that new million-dollar home. The, the Lord didn't do that. Matter of fact, for some of us, if we're honest, we would say he really had nothing to do with that decision. And it's put us in places that's robbing us of our joy. And this morning, the reason I preach on this is because I believe making room for God in this area, we have to address some issues of our identity, who we are as children of the king. Because if your lack of peace is because of a lack of money, you have failed to understand who you are as a child of God. Because what does Jesus do as he unpacks for this audience an understanding of their treasure? he begins to point out some very simplistic things that rob us of treasure. And what does he say? A moth that devours or consumes, that eats away at what? Treasure. Why would Jesus use that term in this first century audience? He, he would use that term because in that audience, their clothing was a status symbol. An individual here would have had the kind of clothing that when you noticed it, you would have taken notice of their wealth because of what they wore. Now, some of you try to, you try to play that. Like, you go out to Macy's and you bought that one outfit that you think people are going to know. No, no, that was their wardrobe because their wealth was a status. And Jesus says, hey, listen, it's like a moth that comes in and begins to gnaw and eat away of that very thing you've put your value, your treasure in. Rust? gnaws away, it eats away, it corrodes a metal, it eats away like mice and rats and consumes. This audience would have understood that. Thieves? In the ancient world, this would have been very obvious. They would have understood that a thief is someone who takes your stuff. As a kid, I still don't remember exactly what age I was. I still believe I was somewhere between the ages of 10 and 12 and I'll never forget this, that our family that night had, as we typically do, I grew up in a home where we had dinner together. And that night we were sitting around the table and we were talking about the day. I mean, I just grew up knowing that that, that time was set apart in our home where if the street lights were out, I best be home. Like I just knew if mom came out saying it's time for dinner and I didn't hear it, you just don't come home. Like you just, you just knew there was a, a problem. And, and that night we're sitting around the dinner table and we're talking about some things and my mom brought up the conversation that when she came home for lunch, she thought the dog or the cat were really restless upstairs and she was running late. She didn't have a chance to go upstairs and see what was going on, but was telling us at the table, y'all might want to go check things out to see if the dog did anything. Went up, didn't, didn't see anything, but, but we had talked at the table about sitting down and doing something as a family that I know there are young folks here today that will not understand what I'm about to say. We were going to go into our living room and we were gonna watch a movie on what was called a VCR, okay? And a VCR was a, a little box that you'd take a rectangular plastic tape that you went to Blockbuster for, and you would rent that tape from Blockbuster, and I'll just tell you the, the kind of growing up I had, we were gonna sit down and watch the Apple Dumpling Gang together and, and, and put that tape in the VCR and enjoy it as a family. And we went into the living room and we looked and the VCR was gone. Well, who, who took the, matter of fact, who took the TV? All of a sudden, we as a family start walking through our home to start listing and noticing all the things that were missing. Went to the back door of our home and we had some acreage behind the house and we realized somebody had taken a crowbar and bent the handle of our door clean off and my mom began to realize they were in the house when she came home for lunch. Now, if you ever struggled to sleep as a kid, that would be the scenario that keeps you from sleeping at night as a kid, okay? That was the moment where we began to realize there was something that happened in our home that they actually took the very things my parents had worked for years to amass. 
It took resources of theirs for years to be able to, to provide for our family and put into our home. And in an instant, it was gone. And something in us wrestled with that. We had fear about that. That happened in my early childhood, and I, I'll never forget it. It's why Jesus is trying to convey. These things will reveal your relationship to money if that's where your heart is. Because it can all be lost. And he says in this text that storing up treasures on earth will, well, it'll lead to a life of frustration. A life of fear. A life that's empty. Now, I think it's safe to say that none of us today would say, I want that to be the story of my life, right? Like no one here today is like, man, I just, I can't wait for that next frustrating moment. Love it, looking forward to it. But see, Jesus tells us how we can avoid it. Look at what he says there in verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Be careful where you swear your allegiance. Let me put it in a more simplistic way for you. If there's something in your life that can change your attitude, can change your actions, can change your emotion, and can change your motives, that is a God. Just, if it's something in your life that can change your emotions, your attitude, and your actions, that's a God. And if we make our money our God, Jesus has some other things and other passages to say about that that are very clear about consequence. And for us today, if we're saying, Pastor, I'm just unwilling to lose my grip on the things that are mine, there's an enemy sitting back saying, Amen. Got you right where I want you. I've got you trapped. I was blown away in first service when I asked this question because I almost didn't even speak about it. And I asked the question, it's an old illustration, but how many of you know how to trap a monkey? Anybody here know how to trap a monkey? Same thing, one person in the audience just like first service. And I'm blown away by that because it's, it's, it's this old tale and it's true. I've actually watched it happen that for a monkey, if you take a gourd, and you hollow it out, and you put a small enough hole in it for a monkey to stick its hand in. Fill it full of rice, or fill it full of fruit, and that monkey holds on to that, grips it, and cannot pull its hand back from that gourd. You can do whatever you want to the monkey, because he's unwilling to let go of it. All the monkey would have to do is release it, and he could pull his hand back out. But he won't do that because he wants what's inside of it so desperately, he's willing to remain trapped even until he dies. Some of you are finding yourself trapped in places because you're unwilling to let some things go. And when I go through scripture and I look at it, even in my quiet time, I can find myself Matthew 19, where I see again a rich young ruler. Matthew 13, this hidden treasure, going through in Luke 12, a parable of abundance, or Luke 21, a widow's offering. Matthew 6, giving to the needy. Your money will tell the truth about your heart. Hear me, there are things we think do this, but it's not true. Your attendance does not reveal your heart, right? You go to a lot of things that you don't necessarily care about, like I went to a lot of bad junior high band concerts when I was in student ministry. I didn't really want to be there, but I went because I had students in it. And, and if we're honest about it, our words do not necessarily communicate what we have value in, right? I'm from Texas. I know what the phrase means, God bless your heart. I know we say a lot of things to people we don't truly mean, but we'll say it because we want to keep up appearances, the events I go to, the, the words I use. I mean, when we think about it, there's a lot of things we do that we think communicate what we value, and they simply don't. You know, see, I, even my service. I serve and give time to some things that I do, a lot of times maybe even just out of well, habit or 
pressure or guilt, but it doesn't necessarily mean I value the thing I give my time to. But our money? <laughs> there are some of you that won't even buy a dollar chocolate bar from the kid next door for his summer baseball league because it's a dollar. Like, like there's some of you here today that when you think about your money, how dare I give my money to something I don't believe in, and you will hold on to that ferociously because you value that at such a level, I'm not about to just give anybody that money. That's why Jesus deals with it. It's a gauge of our heart. It's part of our attitude. Uh, let me hit a different segment of folks here that, that will relate to this. There are some of you that have chose to dabble in the stock market. And maybe some of you are heavily invested in the stock market. But what I know from experience, I mean, I, I, this, this is real. There are companies out there that you would not even know they exist. But because you invested $10, $100, or $1,000, you now track the very movements of their CEO. Like, you invest in to, to, uh, Tesla, and you want to know what Elon Musk did this week because you want to know how it affected your investments. And you will track these things all because you put some money in it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any care in the world. And it's like a magnet that you cannot remove that force that's pulling us towards some things when it comes toward our money. I'll make it simpler. Many of you know my son Carter, Fragile X Syndrome. He was in first service and proved this point to the T. I loved it. Um, and I've talked a little bit about this in regards to his relationship and mine. And, and there are moments that he and Car Carter and I both, we love a good cheeseburger. Like we just, our, our place he and I will go to is Carl's Jr.'s. And we'll sit down and we'll have a cheeseburger. And it never fails. Every single time I sit down with Carter, he'll have his cheeseburger, he'll have his french fries, and he'll have his Coke. And I do it for the laugh. I reach across the table, and I take one of his French fries. And instantly, without hesitation, my son will say, no. No. Bad daddy. My fry. My fry. And if you know Carter, he's serious, too. Like, this isn't like a joking thing. Carter is just outright, in his autistic way, like, Bad daddy, no, no. And, and he will get worked up over a fry. But here's what he doesn't understand. It wasn't his resources that bought the french fries. Amen. But here's what I recognize. I'm not the owner of those resources either. Amen. Because my God not only owns the burger, the drink, and the fry, he owns the entire menu. And what he's given to me to steward, he's calling me to steward in ways he has created. He's put guardrails and he's put these, these mile markers in our life to test our heart and our faithfulness in an area that gauges our spiritual maturity. And I hear it, some of you right now, preacher, this is an Old Testament principle. This is not a New Testament thing. That, that tithing, that offering thing, that's all, that's all Old Testament principle. And you know what you sound like? You actually sound like the, the person we've all seen at some point on a Cops episode or YouTube or some kind of TikTok. You sound like the guy that gets pulled over and an officer searches the back seat of that driver and pulls out an illegal substance. And what do they say? That's not mine. Like somebody put that there. That, 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 that's not mine. I mean, I, I don't know anything about that. And you're trying to play off the fact you don't give because you don't believe it's God, and you're robbing him. You sound like a common thief when it comes to what God's called you to steward. Yeah, I didn't think there'd be an amen after that. Like, like nobody wants to hear that, but no one here today, if you do, do not tell them you go to River Oak Grace, you're a Mormon. Um, if you go to lunch today, and you look at each other across the table when the bill comes, Let's not pay it. Let's get out of here. And you choose to leave without paying your bill. No one here is doing that. But we do it when we come to church thinking, well, I just got what I came for off the menu. I can just leave without paying. Whoa. Like some of you today won't even tip. 
That's not Christ-like. If you're, if you're from here and you tell somebody, hey, we're going to pray for our food. Can we pray for you about anything? Don't you dare be a bad tipper. Don't act like you care about the gospel and not care about the needs of those in your community. And in this moment, we start sounding like people that honestly don't care about the commands of God, which is why you're not experiencing joy in your life. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't get up this morning excited to preach this, but I kind of dig at it. Because <laughs> see, some of you here this morning, when it comes to God, you're saying, don't touch my fries. God, don't, don't take what's mine. Leave it alone, God. Those are my fries. And they're not. And God owns it. You get to worship for the fact he even lets you order The bottom line with this is today, you don't change your behavior because of me. Like, like if today you say, well, I guess I better like start giving because pastor told me to, then you miss the heart of Jesus. Like, like if today you have a behavior modification in your life because of what you're hearing, because you think someone's going to think differently of you if you don't, hear me, the only one you should care about what thinks of you is your father. Your heavenly Father, Lord and Savior, he is the only one here today that your attitudes and actions begin to change for. Not me. I've made it clear. I don't know who gives. I don't know how much you give, and it will always be that way. Why? Because I'm not going to treat you any differently. And, and if you give a lot to this church, I just say amen. Keep doing it. And you've been faithful, and you've been good. But guess what? We owe $3.2 million on a children's building with a $20,000 a month payment. We're trusting you every month to give an offering for, not a tithe, offering. I go to bed every night with that on my mind. God, this month, can we do that? God, this month, will our church be faithful? Because if they're not, God, where does that leave us? What do we do? And I feel like a monkey with my hands in a gourd because I held on to something tightly. But here's the thing. I rest in the fact that both the elders and the body of this church believed God was calling us to do that before we ever put a shovel in the ground. Amen. And we encountered a black swan event that caused the price of that building to go up substantially and God knew on the front end it would happen and we were faithful to complete what he set in front of us to do and I believe with all my heart he will address that as we move forward because we did it for his glory. Amen. And so church, when I talk about giving, I don't do it because it's fashionable. I don't do it because it grows a church. I do it because it's true. Amen. Do it because it's his word. And if today you're saying, man, I'm just looking for a church that is going to make me feel good, this isn't it. <laughs> but if you're looking for a church where you can guarantee you're going to get truth about how you follow the king, you're home. Amen. I promise you, I will be faithful to present the gospel and the fullness of God's word in its totality, even if it makes us uncomfortable, because when we step into that, when we wade into those deeper waters, God shows faithfulness, and he's good. Hey, if today you're inclined to slap a hand and claim it as yours, just evaluate your heart and say, God, Will you help me see it's all yours and you've called me to steward it well. And how you do that is between you and the Father. My greatest concern is that we will be a church that experiences his joy, his love. And so if you want a prosperity gospel, that's it. A prosperity gospel rooted in knowing the favor of God, the love and the joy of God that may not grow your bank account but further your relationship with him, I say amen. amen. It's good. And so today, I wrap this up by just simply asking you, would you take today, place it before the Lord and say, God, if, if this is an area in my life where I've not been faithful with, will you lead me to a place of faith? Will you lead me to a place where I can truly depend on you, your kingdom, and your leading in my life to experience joy? And I didn't say this in first service. I've said this before. And uh, I love it. There's someone here, and they're looking at me right now. Um, and I'm not going to look at them because I'm going to give uh, They took me up on this the first time they began to practice tithing. And I made this statement. If you will be faithful for a year, 
I'll even go as far as say, if you'll be faithful for a month and God does not bless your steps of obedience, I'll give you your money back. If you don't experience freedom in your life and see the joy of being obedient to God's word, we'll give you your money back. Why? It's not ours anyway. God's going to provide for this church. I'm just saying, if, you're, if you need that kind of encouragement to take a step of faith, we'll help you with that. Go hear another preacher say that. I believe in this that deeply. God will honor your steps of obedience toward his heart. And it's why the vision of this church is so clear. Empowering people to take the next step toward the heart of God. And if we can empower you in that, we'll do all we can. All we can. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we want to say thank you. I, I know that the word in which we examine this morning is one that, that it causes some unsettledness, some uneasiness. But yet, Father, I know it's in those moments you do some of your finest work. Father, you call us to greater places of faith and, Father, greater places of, of trust in you. And so, Father, today, would we be honest enough in our own spirit, Father, to join you in this journey, believing you are the provider of all my needs. Lord, if there's someone here this morning that's holding on to the fact that their treasure they earned, they worked hard for, they've been faithful in their job, Father, would you remind them this morning you gave them the very breath to breathe to go to their job. That, Father, that you gave them opportunities to have resources and treasures that are benefiting and blessing their family. Father, would you just remind them of how quickly in their own work things can change. But, Father, how steadfast, how true, how faithful you remain. Lord, would you show us that this morning? We love you, Father. We thank you for your word, for your faithfulness, your sacrifice in our life. In your name we pray, amen.